So this is the second day of uh, our three-day uh, venture. Um, I'm delighted to have the chance of saying something about Nick, um, because I've been a fan of his for, I think we worked out about 37 years now. Um, and I remember the day when uh, he very sweetly came to Paddington Station uh, on a bank holiday to give me a tutorial on discounting. So he's that sort of person. Um, Nick has given a huge amount to the school. Um, as you probably know, he was the director of Stickard um, for five years in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, he actually invented the idea of the research lab that was, was then created about uh, 10 years um, after that, which we all benefit from. And of course, he's now come back to the school um, to head the Grantham Institute. Uh, but in the meantime, he made big contributions to uh, public life um, as a chief economist at the EBRD and then the World Bank, uh, and then in the Treasury, where, of course, he was in charge of the Stern Report. Uh, that is about, that was about, um, the most important issue facing humanity, which is uh, the survival of the pattern of life, of human life uh, on Earth, which we're used to. Uh, it's an incredibly important issue, and I think the Stern Report did more than almost anything else to highlight it. Of course, it's not a new issue. And I remember reading this a wonderful book called Turning Up the Heat in 1988, which said an awful lot of what is said in the Stern Report. But even uh, in the mid-2000s, um, there were many climate deniers in Britain, and there still are some. Uh, I was a member of the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee uh, inquiry into climate change, which Nick gave evidence to, um, and there were two or three climate change deniers in there, um, but they got their comeuppance, because <laughs> their idea was that this is a plot, climate change is a plot, uh, devised by interested parties, um, and uh, of whom one was the Department of the Environment, who had an interest in it, because it would make them a more important department. Therefore, the issue must be taken from them and given to the Treasury. Um, but who did it land on? Uh, on whose desk did it land at the Treasury at Nick's turn? So they, they uh, uh, bit the dust. Um, this was a very, a very, very uh, important uh, report, and um, it has had ramifications all over the world. Um, we are incredibly privileged, I think, to have Nick updating it for us uh, five and a half years later. And um, he's going to be talking, he did a sort of big overview uh, yesterday, which uh, I think probably most of you will have heard. Today he's going to be talking about two topics, public policy and the scope for, for technological uh, change. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, you may know the story of the noble lord um, who had a dream, uh, and he dreamt that he was giving a public lecture. Uh, and when he woke up, he found that that was just what he was doing. Uh, I can assure you Nick is, is wide awake. Nick. <laughs> thank you very much, Richard, and, and thank you for the um, friendship and academic interaction over nearly uh, 40 years. Um, it's one of the reasons I feel so at home at the LSE. Another one, of course, is because my mother was at the LSE in the, in the 1940s, so I feel a, um, a very direct uh, um, link and attraction to the place. And last five years since I've been back, I felt very much at, at home again. Now, this last time, um, and sorry, and I should say also, it's very nice to see uh, members of the Robbins family here again, and thank you very much for coming. Last time I spoke about the degree of risk, the nature of the risk, the scale of the response which was necessary if we looked at that risk from the point of view of sensible risk management. This time I want to focus on what we actually do. How do we um, make policy? What kind of uh, activities are we trying to foster? What's the nature of this um, industrial revolution that I spoke about? And how does policy 
foster it, make it happen. If you like, it's a dynamic public economics. It's not simply comparing different equilibria when you overcome a particular market failure. It's asking how you accelerate a process of change. Because this is a story where the pace of change is of the essence for the reasons I described, I described last time. Um, remember, we spoke about the dangers of delay, the dangers of delay through this flow stock process of the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And if you pause and wait, then the concentrations have gone up and you start from an even more difficult position than now. If you pause and wait, you lock in uh, through your capital and infrastructure high carbon um, activities. So this is, a, this is very different from, say, international trade, where in international trade, if you delay, if you don't reform, if you don't um, gain, if you don't participate in the gains from international trade, it may be a pity, you may have lost something for a while. But when you pick up the baton, you're starting more or less where you were before. That's not true for this one. The pace of change matters. So we have to discuss it beyond simply the kind of comparative statics stories of market failure that we use so much in economics. We have to think of it in terms of how do we foster change. So it's a dynamic public economic story and that's the way I'll try to, um, I'll try to tell it. So let's again move quickly because there's, uh, there's lots, uh, lots to cover. So this is the structure of what I want to say, um, talking about the scale of investment that will be necessary to bring about the kind of change I was describing yesterday, then turn to the policies, then I'll be talking about what's going on, what's going on in the private sector, what's going on in different sectors, and what's going on in different countries. And tomorrow I'll put that together to try to give an international story. So this is primarily about the policies, and the kinds of change that we need to encourage and the kinds of change that are happening. Remember last time I emphasized very strongly that we were embarked through the Copenhagen and Cancun uh, agreements on emissions on a much better path than business as usual, but nowhere near strong enough to give us anything like a two degree uh, centigrade um, above the 19th century with even a 50-50 chance of holding to two degrees with even a 50-50 chance. So I'll continue that argument today. We are indeed moving in a much better direction than business as usual, but it's nowhere near fast enough, and uh, it'll be next time where I focus particularly on how to accelerate um, that change. Now, as before, I'm not going to go through all these slides. Slides for lectures one and two are already up on the website. Um, they do set out in much more detail than I'll be able to do in the time um, I have available today. So you won't see all the slides. I'm deliberately not showing you all the slides, otherwise you'll sit and read them and not look at me, and I'd rather like you to look at me and listen. So uh, I'm just going to pick up and focus on just a, uh, a few of these slides. Let me remind you first the scale of the change we're talking about. We've got to cut emissions per unit of output from something like 50 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent per annum now, for the world as a whole, down to somewhere below 35, 20 years from now, and somewhere below 20, uh, 40 years from now, to be roughly on a, 50, a, char uh, a path that holds to two degrees with roughly a 50-50 probability. I mean, it would be nice if we could do better than that, but that's where uh, I'm going to talk about, that's what I'm going to talk about, and it's going to be pretty tough for us to get even that. That means you have to divide total emissions by a factor of two and a half. If the world's economies are managed well, including and particularly in relation to climate change, we might grow by a factor of three in terms of output over 40 years. So if you're cutting by two and a half, absolutely, and emissions, and, and output, output is growing by a factor of three, then emissions per unit of output have to be cut by a factor of three times two and a half, something, well, obviously three times two and a half is seven and a half, so you're gonna to have to cut emissions per unit of output by a factor of seven or eight, and that's why I think we have to call it an energy industrial revolution, because it's a radical change in uh, what you're doing in terms of emissions. You have to restructure the way in which you consume and produce to allow change of that kind of magnitude. And you have to move from here to there 
fairly rapidly and steadily. You can't obviously just wait till year 49 and cut it all back in uh, the last year. So that's the uh, challenge that um, I want to talk about, and that's the kind of scale that we're talking about here. Um, now, an in industrial revolutions are quite exciting things. Now, this is um, from uh, the work of Carlotta Perez, who many of you will have seen lecturing here at the LSE. She worked closely with Chris Freeman, who spoke in terms of these five ways, five waves of innovation and technical change. Chris Freeman was, of course, here at the London School of Economics. Indeed, he was here at the London School of Economics with my mother in the 1940s. So uh, I feel quite close to this particular story as well for family reasons. But those are the waves of technological change that Chris spoke about. He was very much a Schumpeterian historian of uh, economic change. This is diagrammatic, but what you see in these stories is waves of innovation and discovery which last for two or three decades. The ICT uh, revolution, information communications technology, it looks to be lasting actually a good deal longer than that. It, in this graph, the information and technology curve turns down. It probably shouldn't. We may, who knows if we're even in the middle of uh, that one. And we actually have a fortunate state of affairs. I mean, life's difficult enough, but we're fortunate that the ICT revolution and the biotech revolutions are happening at the same time as the emissions energy revolution. It makes life uh, easier because you have a whole range of options that you wouldn't have had if you just tried to tackle this um, just by operating directly on emissions and energy. But the story then is one of a process of discovery. But it's also a process of dislocation and disruption. And that's why I think the language of industrial revolution is quite useful. Because revolutions have blood on the carpet. They're not simple, natural, cuddly, green growth stories where you just get sort of cleaner and greener and everything gets more cheerful in a fairly direct way. Revolutions have dislocation and disruption. That's the point. If they don't, then they're not giving you the kind of change that you're talking about. So whilst this is exciting in terms of discovery and in terms of creativity and innovation, and it, you would see, if we do this well, two or three decades of boosted growth as we engage and invest and innovate, you're also going to have some disruptive change to manage. And that will be part of the story as well. So that's the kind of change that we're talking about here. And what I want to do is, in this lecture is talk about the policies that can foster that and the kinds of changes that will be um, involved. Let me um, begin by um, talking about um, the kinds of costs that we're likely to bear as a result of all this. But let me emphasize that no two waves of te technological change, no two industrial revolutions look alike. And one, they have some common features, some of which I've just described. But this one is a particular difference because it does require policy. In earlier industrial revolutions, probably the government's best role was just to get out of the way. Couldn't be exactly that. Of course, you can't build railways without some kind of legal framework that allows you to take railways across land. You're always going to have some kind of government policy, but in this case, government policy is absolutely central. This is about helping markets work well by correcting the fundamental market failure associated with unpriced greenhouse gas emissions. There are other market failures too, which I want to focus on, very important ones. But this one does require government policy. If you just let things happen, then this probably would not uh, materialize, at least nowhere near on the scale that would be necessary. So this is a fundamental feature of this wave of technological change, which is different um, from earlier ones. The story of innovation and discovery, I think, will be uh, Hayekian and Schumpeterian, and uh, we underline Hayek, of course, because, um, as I mentioned yesterday, one of LSE's Nobel Prize winners and a great friend of Lionel Robbins. Now, this revolution 
is on its way, but it's still very nascent. It's still in its very early stages. But this is a, just a, a minor indication, if you like, uh, quantitatively, of looking at the way in which low carbon patent, low carbon patents as a share of total patents have started to uh, rise in Europe. These are just European uh, patents. And you can see they really have started to move up in the last five or six years. One obvious correlation here is with the oil price. As hydrocarbons get more expensive, then you would indeed expect people to find ways of doing things differently. That's encouraging because it suggests that the price of carbon might well have some effect. If you were incredibly self-centered, you'd notice the acceleration of that was sometime around the publication of the Stern Review, but I wouldn't possibly uh, want to claim, claim the credit. Now, this is um, something which I meant to emphasize more strongly last time than I did, and I'm not going to say very much about it, but it is of fundamental importance. We're already seeing the importance and the challenges of adaptation to a changing climate, at the 0.8 degrees centigrade we've seen above the 19th century up to now. It's going to be very hard to avoid temperatures increasing by at least one degree centigrade more. And that one degree centigrade more is going to be a lot tougher incrementally than the 0.8 degree centigrade that we've um, had to face up to now. And of course, if you get into three and four degrees, you're getting into changes at least at four degrees that may be uh, so difficult that adaptation isn't quite the right word uh, to use. They could become almost unmanageable. But we will have to adapt. I'm not going to dwell on it. We will have to adapt. And it's very important not to put adaptation, mitigation, and development into separate boxes. A lot of water management, a lot of water management is about adaptation to a changing and more hostile climate. It's about organizing water in a way that uses less energy. If you stop flooding the paddy fields, as, uh, which is a pretty inefficient way to use uh, water, you release um, less methane. If you go for less, till, less tilling in agriculture, you increase water uh, conservation and you release less carbon uh, from low tilling. And of course, if you save energy and save water, then you're enhancing development. These are, that's one big example, the whole water and agriculture area, where adaptation, mitigation, and development are all tied up together. We have to think of them, and occasionally it's useful to think of them as separate concepts, but when we're thinking about development, and thinking about practice, thinking about implementation, we have to remember very strongly and clearly that these are very tightly bound together. All kinds of things. You can make that same statement for all kinds of things like buildings and city management and, uh, and power and, and so on. So I won't emphasize those examples, but I hope they're fairly clear. And I won't come back to this all that often, but I did want to underline it strongly because um, most of what I have to say will be about um, the whole story of the Industrial Revolution, which is cutting the emissions. And I didn't want to lose that emphasis on adaptation. Now, um, let me turn to the story of policy. The, no, let me talk, turn to how much all this is going to cost, and then I'll turn to the story of policy. Now, uh, in the Stern Review, we talked about extra investment of the order of 1% to 2% of GDP to make the kinds of changes that we're talking about here across the economy as a whole. The 1% of GDP was because at that time we talked about a range for stabilization of concentrations in terms of CO2 equivalent, sorry, in terms of parts per million of CO2 equivalent. We spoke in terms of concentrations of 450 to 550. I think looking back, um, the 550 uh, notion, the 550 concentrations, was much too high. That corresponds, roughly speaking, to a median um, temperature increase of close to 3 degrees centigrade, and that's very high. So I think now, uh, if we were going back to the Stern Review, most of us involved would talk about 450, not the range 450 to 550. And if you're talking about 450, you're talking about uh, investment in the range of perhaps 2% of GDP uh, per annum, extra investment 
rather than 1%. Since the Stern Review, we have seen uh, technical progress, I think, rather faster than we had anticipated at that time. And that would bring those costs down, or those in extra investment needed down. On the other hand, we haven't moved as fast as we should have done. And in those five years, we've added um, uh, something uh, of the order of 15 parts per million in the five years. And that's made life more difficult and, of course, locked in more high carbon infrastructure in that time. So I think, broadly speaking, we'd stick with an estimate of the extra investment involved of the order of magnitude of 2% of GDP. You do that by going through the different kinds of areas and asking what's necessary. Other people have looked at that uh, as well. McKinsey's, the World Economic Forum, Aidenhofer and others. And broadly speaking, those ballpark estimates of extra investment needed being around 2% of GDP um, is fairly central for achieving a stabilization around 450 parts per million is fairly central amongst the estimates that um, have been made. Now, I want to draw a sharp distinction here between investment and cost. Some people like to think, how much is it going to cost? Well, investment and cost are different things. Um, when you're talking about making those extra investments, that's exactly what you're talking about, making extra investments. Now, those extra investments have returns. They have returns in terms of avoided carbon. And if you're investing to avoid the carbon, then it's sensible to associate uh, that extra investment as being a cost of removing the carbon if you put the current costs in as well. But it's deeper than that. Because investment leads to discovery. Investment leads to new techniques. Investment leads to learning, which brings down costs in the future. And there are all sorts of other co-benefits here. Um, energy security, uh, cleaner, quieter, safer, more biodiverse ways of um, living and existing. And a lot of those things come through much earlier than the reduced risks of climate change. So we have to separate or think about investment and cost in different ways. And because the cost part of it is so difficult to calculate, given the offsetting nature of the discovery, the cleaner, quieter, safer, more biodiverse, I prefer to think more directly in terms of the practical question of how much extra investment are you going to have to make. The task of translating that into costs, given what I've just described, is too complicated. Um, it may be of order of magnitude quite similar to 2%. I suspect it's quite substantially lower than that because of the offsetting benefits that you have to net off. But the practical question is how much extra investment do you have to make? That's what we need to uh, think about. So that will be um, where I want to focus. And that's where a lot of these estimates have come up with roughly the same kind of story. But it is very important, and uh, if you look at the last bullet on this slide, I'm not asking you to read them all, but please look at the last bullet. Bad policy can raise investment and costs. And there's no shortage of supply of bad policy uh, advice and practice. So you have to constantly ask yourself and challenge, are we doing this in a way that's as efficient and equitable as possible? And look at policies uh, toughly to ask that kind of question. So let's turn to the policies. We've talk, talked about the kind of change. We've talked about, spoken about the scale of investment that's necessary. And let's look at the policies. Well, obviously, the greenhouse gas externality is fundamental here. This whole story is one of um, enormous damage done to future generations by the kinds of ways we produce and consume now. That's an externality. That's inefficient. Uh, if we did uh, less of it, then uh, suppose you let me just give you the clear standard economics uh, of Pareto efficiency. Suppose I had two types of good, uh, one which was polluting and one to future generations, and one which was not polluting. If I substituted a little bit on the margin um, at current prices towards the non-polluting activity, 
doing it in a way that leaves the current generation just as well off as they were before. You know, suppose bananas are polluting and apples are not polluting, and we substitute from bananas to apples in just the kind of proportions in the marginal rate of substitution, if you like, that keeps this generation just as well off as we were before, then the future generation is unambiguously better off. That's a prey to improvement. That's underlying the story that this is a market externality, it's inefficient, and by combating it, we could, in principle, make everybody better off. It isn't as simple as that. The big investments that we have to make are probably investments that we do have to think about. <coughs> Excuse me, that we do have to think about as a, an extra cost on this generation. But in principle, the story... <coughs> well, it must be... Uh, it's not the argument, so it must be something in the air. Um, greenhouse gas. Sorry? Greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm allergic to greenhouse gases. <laughs> so that's the story of the greenhouse gas externality and why it's inefficient for the standard kinds of reasons that market failure and externalities are inefficient. So we could, in principle, overdo all this in such a way as to leave everybody better off. As I said, it's a bit more complicated than that, not so easy to do, but it is important to remember that what we're doing is not necessarily just sacrificing, we're just finding different ways of doing things. That is a fundamental market failure to correct that unpriced greenhouse gas emission. But it's much more than that. And it's the other things that I want to emphasize today because we always talk about the market failure associated with the greenhouse gas. And it is indeed the biggest market failure, in my view, the world, the world has ever seen. We all do it. We're all involved. And the damage done, which uh, the damage done is on the scale, which I described last time, and it's enormous. So it is reasonable to call it the biggest market failure the world has ever seen, including bankers. The, um, but it's much more than that. It's research and development. This is a process of discovery. This is about new techniques. It's about innovation. And we know that an idea is an idea. It's a public good. So people who try and fail, people who try and succeed in different ways of doing things, bring benefits to others. That's a standard argument in R&D in economics, and it's an important one. And it's particularly important in this area because of the pressure of time um, and the gains that everybody makes from implementing new ideas. So it's a standard argument, the public good nature of research and development, that you give ideas to others when you discover them or try them. But I think it's still stronger in this environment because of the pressure of time and the gain that everybody makes if the idea is implemented. There are lots, of course, as we know very well, imperfections in long-term risk and capital markets. They handle risk after a fashion, but none of us would argue that those markets for risk and capital over the long term are anything like perfect and they have all kinds of failures. And I think that's why in this area uh, de development banks or green investment banks make a lot of sense, and I'll come back to that. There are lots of network externalities. In the last 15 or 20 years, network, external network externalities have been a big part of modern economic analysis. Uh, you know, if you acquire a mobile phone, assuming you don't use it in offensive uh, ways, then the value of my mobile phone goes up because I can call you. Those are network externalities. These kinds of networks can't function very well without some kind of government platform. It may be actually government-supplied infrastructure, but it might be uh, arrangements that government makes for those networks to work. Public transport is clearly this kind of network. Um, electricity grids, this kind of network, and so on. So they're very important network externalities here, networks that uh, really matter, which will be part of the policy process. This is an area where people don't necessarily have uh, very good information. Labeling or legislation on labeling or offering of labeling by retailers can be a very important part of the story. Making it easier for people to make these kinds of investments and information will be a big part of that. And I've already mentioned the co-benefits here. 
if you act to reduce greenhouse emi gas emissions by protecting the forest, you'll also be protecting the biodiversity in those forests. So bringing in appropriate pricing for all those things which can be boosted by action on climate change will also be a part of a market failure. If you don't do that, you're not giving the full credit, the full returns in your market signals and incentives to activities to reduce carbon emissions. None of the six externalities that I've got here, or the six types of market failure, none of them are small. It's not simply the case, therefore, that you just get the price of greenhouse gases right and everything else follows. This is a much more complicated story than that because of the interactions with the rest of the economy, because of the uh, networks, and fundamentally because of the learning and information that's at the heart of this story. <laughs> so whilst these areas are of fundamental uh, importance, simply in the ordinary kind of static analysis that we talk about, if we, I think, put them all together, we get a fundamental combination of things that can really help with the dynamics of um, this transition, the fostering of the change. Now, there's lots to say about carbon taxes and cap and trade and regulation, and many of you will have looked at that kind of thing already. Sp supporting R&D, fundamental to this whole story, is a very big subject in uh, economics and one in which uh, many of our colleagues here at the LSE have contributed in a very strong way. I'm not going to dwell on those from the point of view of what I have to say today. I'm actually going to deliberately focus on four aspects which economists often leave out of policy. Not always. Um, we're a pretty creative, cheerful lot. I'm not talking about uh, uh, all economists, but I'm saying in economic discussion, in public discussion of policy, these things often get left out, and that's why I'm focusing on them today. Not necessarily because they're overwhelmingly more important than things like how cap and trade schemes work. It's that uh, that has been discussed a lot, and I'd prefer to put the emphasis on areas which are dis discussed too little. So let me begin with the role of values and sense of responsibility. Now, there's some of you here tonight, um, maybe Howard and Richard and myself, who remember the 1960s. And uh, at that time, we brought in legislation in this country on drink and driving. And uh, there was great hostility that uh, the working man, it was usually a man they were talking about, had just acquired a bit of money, just acquired a car, and there he was, uh, having had a hard day at work, going off down the pub at night, having a few beers and coming back. And what right do you have? to kill off that kind of uh, freedom of enjoyment, freedom of pleasure, and freedom of activity. It is an outrageous interference in civil liberties, and indeed it's regressive. This is the kind of discussion that was there. I know it sounds very odd to you, those of you who don't remember the 1960s, but um, I assure you that was the kind of discussion that did take place. Now, why, does, why do young people do much less drink driving than we used to do? Partly because they're heavy penalties, that's the stick and the carrot. That's the incentive of the economist. And you forget those kinds of incentives at your peril. I'm not putting those to one side, absolutely not. That's the economics of Pigou and James Mead, and it matters like mad. But there's more to it than that. I hope most of us don't drink and drive because we regard it as irresponsible. And how did we come to regard it as irresponsible? We looked at the evidence. We discussed it. It was very much a part of public discussion. Values here do matter. Senses of responsibility do matter. And I think that is something that's of uh, fundamental importance. It's enormously important to public policy. It's just that economists don't discuss it very much. You know, tobacco and alcohol, drugs, health in general, recycling, litter. Our attitudes to those things change because we talk about them and we discuss them and indeed we legislate on them. So that's a story, I think, where changing values, changing sense of responsibility is part of the overall policy problem, and it's something that is, I think, important. I do think, for example, people have a much less, rela less relaxed attitude about the throwing down of litter than they might have had 40 or 50 years ago. And that's not because they think... I, I, don't, I don't know anybody who's been fined for throwing litter. 
I mean, I know people have been fined for other things, but I don't know people, anybody who's been fined for throwing litter, but most of us would think it's a rather bad thing to do. Those values don't come out of nowhere. They come out of discussion and evidence and sharing ideas. So that, I think, is a very important part of um, this story. A second example is the role of standards. Now, standards can make, you know, standards can be badly applied, they can be silly, but many standards, if designed well, can actually foster change in a strong and constructive way. And for good economic reasons, they bring, it, they bring clarity, uh, they reduce uncertainty, they promote scale so that people who are wondering whether they need to go in a particular direction with the investments that will be necessary to go there can have some confidence that um, the markets for these different ways of doing things will be there. Think, of, think for example, of unleaded petrol. Um, we, could in, we could have had a price for unleaded petrol and that could have helped people search out ways of doing it. It would have been quite difficult to work out what that price should be. Instead, we went to unleaded petrol, and it did actually make um, quite a big difference quite quickly at a much lower cost than was uh, uh, articulated by the manufacturers at the time. So standards are a good way of doing things, if done carefully and if done uh, sensibly. And I, that judging carefully and sensibly will, of course, um, be something that you have to look at. If you see how rapidly change can come about, this, if you just look at the 10 years, 2000 to 2010, you can see a rapid decline in the way in which the um, uh, emissions of new fleets uh, have developed in response uh, to standards. The two lines at the bottom are uh, Europe and Japan. So you can get pretty rapid change. And this, of course, is associated particularly with uh, energy efficiency. <laughs> So I've mentioned values, I've mentioned standards. Now I'd like to mention institutions. Within institutions, um, I must say I'm strongly influenced by my life as chief economist of the EBRD. Um, people have been quite snooty in economics about different kinds of development banks. But the EBRD was a bank, uh, is a bank, which was established uh, around... Um, well, it was established in 1991, just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, to foster economic change, indeed foster the transition to the open market economy in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Its articulated objective was to foster transition, to foster change. And it was about moving to a better functioning market economy. And in many ways, this is a story about moving to a better functioning market economy, a market economy that takes into account the failures that uh, would be there without the kind of policies and institutions which we're discussing. Now, in what way does such a bank have a role? Well, such a bank has a role because its existence can reduce policy risk. Because the bank is there, the source of the policy risk, which is governments, may actually be less prone to jumping about and being more difficult. So you're, by having the presence of that bank and the projects which it finances, you're reducing the policy risks that people face. For example, when we were in the EBRD sponsoring some uh, investments in the energy sector in the former Soviet Union, you had big com companies, like the big oil companies, would come and ask the EBRD to get involved because it would, for them, reduce the policy risk. They didn't actually need the funds, but they did need some of the insurance which the presence brings itself. Such banks develop expertise. Such banks can have convening power so that they can syndicate and bring people together in a strong way. So I think there is a powerful case for this kind of... Uh, institution, and uh, I have to confess, I'm on the um, advisory board of the Green Investment Bank at uh, the government's request, unpaid and only an advisory board, I hasten uh, to add. Um, but I do think that the Green Investment Bank is a good idea for the kinds of reasons I described. Not because it has some special um, subsidy and undercutting role, 
It's because the way in which it's put together helps to overcome other market failures, in particular the policy risk which uh, I've underlined. But it has beyond that a convening power which an ordinary bank doesn't have and it has long-term capital as well. And that ability to give long-term capital is itself overcoming some of the market failures in the uh, markets for capital that we see. <coughs> now, if you put these various things together, and this is the very last bullet on this slide, you have something which you can crudely bring together as the investment climate. Good policies, the right kind of institutions, governance that's uh, steady and not predatory, an infrastructure designed to capture and overcome, or designed to overcome some of the network externalities that I was talking about, can together give you a good climate for investment, which can foster the type of investment that I've been talking about, and the transition and the industrial revolution that I'm discussing here. So that's why institutions are important. Finally, in the area of policy, I want to emphasize the role of the community. You can't recycle and reuse without a community. Public transport requires a community. Carpooling requires a community. You, if you look at uh, changing, uh, insulate, bringing insulation, better energy conservation to a whole neighborhood, that is much cheaper if you do that uh, within a community. The power of the example is very important here. Well, there's no power of example unless you're in a community and people are learning from others. And I've already talked about the way in which people develop uh, values and senses of responsibility. So in thinking about economics here, there is this whole range of six market failures I described, but I've chosen to concentrate my discussion on um, these areas which, in my view, uh, get uh, under-discussed in this uh, in this story. That's values, uh, standards, institution, and communities. All the other six I emphasized earlier are extremely important, but they are much discussed already. Now, the final point I want to make on policy is the great importance of credibility. People are making long-term decisions here, long-term investments. They're taking on risk. And government is a big source of risk because this is an industrial revolution that has to be driven in large measure by public policy. So the government itself brings a big part of the risk. That's why I emphasize institutions like the EBRD and the Green Investment Bank. So a constant challenge to those of us who are involved in government in some shape or form, even if it's the weak form of the House of Lords, is to try to hold government to account for the stability of its policy. And particularly during this recession, we've seen governments in Europe start to jump about. And that is very damaging to long-term investment. Credibility, constancy, when you're making risky long-term investments, when you're taking on change, are of fundamental importance. <coughs> now, let me say uh, the, la the last three parts of what I have to say are about how different parts of the economy, how different sectors are moving. Uh, private sector, the particular sectors, and then countries as a whole. So let me move fairly rapidly through this. But it's actually quite a positive story that I'm about to tell of the way in which change is coming about and the opportunities that we have. Remember, that's in the context of what I argued yesterday, that we're moving much too slowly, but there's some positive straws in the wind. Indeed, there are more than straws in the wind, and that's what I want to uh, emphasize. This is a story of the growth of clean energy investment. Just over the last seven years or so, it's moved up very rapidly. Source of these data are uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which is a very good source of um, investment and finance activities in this uh, area. You are seeing these move up, and these are quite big numbers now, even though they're a lot smaller than they need to be. You've got um, clean energy investment um, up to uh, $260 billion uh, last year and moving upwards. These are the countries in which you see the biggest activities, Europe, US, and China, clearly simply because of the weight of those economies uh, in the story. But they are uh, moving forward. And, often as a direct result of government policy. The private sector itself is a major driver of, um, information, of 
innovation. And you get all kinds of big stories. And I've just given a few examples here. Some of them are in the billions. DuPont, through energy efficiency, over the last 20 years or so, has saved about six billion in uh, energy costs. Waste management, a big US waste firm, is identifying around um, nine billion in value from us usable materials it currently sends to landfill. But those are examples in the billions, and there are many of them. The one that I enjoyed particularly was at Durban uh, in December last year, which was an example of um, plastic water bottles used for lighting in the Philippines. This is not in terms of billions, these are tiny costs. You take a used water bottle and you cut it in half and you stick it through the roof, taking into account you know, the need to waterproof the roof. You stick it in the middle of the roof and during the day it acts like a uh, 30 or 40 watt lamp to light the room. It's absolutely brilliant. It costs almost nothing and it means that you get a great energy saving and a great pollution saving because otherwise you'd probably be burning hurricane lamps or different kinds of things inside that room to get a bit of uh, light. So there's all kinds of creativity here. I just wanted to emphasize that one to show that this isn't boffins and, um, and uh, laboratories, all this stuff. It's sometimes ordinary people finding really clever ways to save energy and make their life uh, better. And not just save energy, make their hut a lot less polluting. The, you may get depressed sometimes about the um, way in which policy is moving in the United States. But the US Navy has uh, an objective by 2020 to have half of its um, uh, energy on shore and uh, on sea um, from non-hydrocarbon sources, partly nuclear, partly biofuels. And it's working with Maersk, the biggest shipping company of all, to develop these and make these changes. So the creativity here, the places that changes uh, are happening are quite remarkable. Much of it, or most of it, private sector, but things like the uh, collaboration between the US Navy and Merck uh, in biofuels as uh, a public-private partnership. So there are many examples like that, and I just wanted to draw attention to a few of them to emphasize the um, creativity here. <laughs> the, those kinds of examples I gave are things that are happening now, but there's lots of speculative stuff as well. There's a whole spectrum from the uh, story of um, solar and wind, which I'll turn to in just a moment, things which we know and understand, all the way through to very new ideas. And here are just a few of the very new ideas. We're seeing nuclear waste as a possible fuel, um, which could power the UK for 500 years. We don't know whether these things are going to work. Some of them will, some of them uh, won't. Um, Nano batteries look to have great potential for the storing of energy. Carbon capture and storage may not be simply capturing uh, the carbon and putting it uh, down into the aquifers. It may be that we can turn it into something solid and build roads and um, buildings. We might be able to generate uh, electricity just by painting things on um, our windows. And of course, recently we've come to realize the opportunity of meat from stem cells, which will be far more efficient than uh, sending the cows and sheep and so on, round and round for uh, months and years on end, burning up all that uh, energy. You may be able to do it in the lab. Now, I'm not advocating nuclear and I'm not advocating meat from stem cells. As, uh, you know, who knows? It could be if you want it to taste like this, just tell us how you want it to taste. We'll make it that way. I'm not advocating. What I'm trying to do is to illustrate the fertility, the creativity that we're seeing here. Ideas are just bubbling up, I think, at a rate that would have been very surprising six or seven years ago. Some of them will be mad. Even if 15% or 20% are not mad, we're probably seeing enough ideas coming through to start to give us the chance, if we have the right kind of policies, to make the changes that we need. Let me say a few things quickly about sectors. Now, this is a pie chart just to remind us that this industrial revolution has got to be everywhere. I mean, two-thirds of it concerns energy, one-third of it other areas. But within energy, there's all kinds of things 
uh, electricity and heat and transportation and so on. You can't get a division of emissions per unit of output by a factor or seven or eight and leave big sectors of the economy out. It's just not possible. You've got to act across the board. And that's why we think of this as an industrial revolution. Of course, energy is the bigger part of the story, but it's not all the story. It's about two thirds of the story. Where should we be acting? Well, this is a, in, a, um, an international energy agency diagram. It's just focusing on the energy side of things. But they're arguing here, by looking at the various different possibilities, a figure which I mentioned yesterday, that roughly half of what we need to do on the energy front will be associated with energy efficiency. There's no one silver bullet, but the biggest part of the story is energy efficiency. And that is absolutely uh, fundamental. These things, um, Bob Sokolow of, of Princeton first produced these kinds of diagrams. They're sometimes called wedges for obvious reasons. It's, uh, each one of those is a, is a wedge, but wedges have been quite popular. But they do help us understand what kinds of activities, what kinds of scale of activities are likely to deliver us the kind of things uh, on the scale that we that we're going to we're going to um, we're going to need. So those are the key areas of action. Energy efficiency of fundamental importance. Now, what about hydrocarbons? Well, two things I want to say on hydrocarbons is there's far too much of it. Carbon Tracker produced a nice uh, calculation, a neat calculation. It's not a nice calculation. It's rather a nasty one. But the their calculation was that if we burned simply the proven hydrocarbons, the proven reserves that we uh, know about, we would uh, actually be emitting double our budget over the next 40 years or so. Either we learn to use these in a clean way, or we don't use them, or we're simply not going to have any chance of holding to 2 degrees centigrade. You can't believe that we have a commitment to hold to 2 degrees centigrade and the valuation that we now see on those hydrocarbon reserves. You can't hold both those positions simultaneously. So either there's a risk to the planet or there's a risk to the shares in hydrocarbons. It's one or the other. And I'm not telling you which it is, but it's one or the other. You can't have both unless you think there's going to be a massive and immediate increase in carbon capture and storage in clean ways of using hydrocarbons. The second thing I want to point to is substitution within hydrocarbons. Coal is about twice as damaging as gas. It may be that the increase in gas um, availability and the reduction of gas prices, particularly in the US, could allow us some kind of bridge over the next 10 or 20 years if they substitute for coal. If they substitute for coal. If they substitute for renewables, of course, then we'll be going backwards but they could allow some sort of bridge as the skills in renewables build up and as the costs come down. But only if policy is constructed in a way that they actually replace coal and not the renewables. The obvious, most effective way of doing that, in my view, would just make sure you've got a good floor price for carbon so that uh, coal um, carries the cost which it really should have if you put in a proper carbon price. But we should remember that technical progress is not just occurring in renewables in the areas I'm describing. Technical progress is also occurring in hydrocarbons, and that'll be a big part of the story. It may be helpful if gas substitutes for coal for a while. The grid structure in energy will be very important in taking this uh, forward. A grid structure will allow you to um, produce wind energy where it's windy, which is uh, in the UK particularly, and it'll allow you to produce solar where it's sunny, which is not particularly in the UK. And with a good grid structure covering uh, Europe, you would actually get uh, energy produced, renewable energy produced where it's most efficient, and you'd handle intermittency. The wind is usually blowing somewhere, the sun is usually shining, is usually shining somewhere. You would actually start to get um, a... Uh, much greater potential for the supply and low cost of um, renewables. Falling cost of renewables, well the falling cost of solar has been absolutely remarkable. Um, 
1955, the price per watt was something close to $3,000. It's now under $2 uh, per watt. If you just look at the price of solar PV in the last couple of years, it's come down by a factor of around two. And um, I, I hate to do name dropping, but I'll do it. I was having a conversation in Davos this year at the end of January with Mohammed Yunus of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And he's got this organization called Grameen Shakti, which brings um, solar, um, small micro solar, with the aid of microfinance to villages in Bangladesh. He's saying, I'm doing, I'm, these things are selling pretty well without any government assistance. It's a, just a little over $1 a watt. If I could only bring it down to 50 cents a watt, we'd just cover Bangladesh. After that dinner, I had an appointment to meet uh, Zheng Rongxi, who is the CEO of Suntech, the biggest PV manufacturer in the world. From He's an Aust Australian. Uh, he started his life in Australia, and then he is of Chinese extraction, and he, he set up Suntech in, uh, in China. So I said, well, Mr. Shengron, she is outside. Let's go and talk to him. And um, I, I introduced Mohammed Yunus and Shengron Shi. And Shengron Shi promised to give it to him for 50 cents a watt in a couple of years from now. And it's entirely plausible. It's, it's come down by a factor of 50% in the last year or so. You're starting to see uh, this kind of uh, activity at last be competitive. Um, the uh, same kind of story is there with wind, although that's uh, falling much less fast than solar. It's still falling, and it's close to competitive, uh, although it depends how you do the calculations, uh, with combined cycle gas uh, turbines. Of course, it depends how you calculate for intermittency. It depends what the price of gas is, and so on. But those falling costs have started to uh, bring uh, in some, something close to uh, grid parity uh, in relation to the hydrocarbons. Offshore wind is still very much more expensive and probably will be for um, some time. It's not just electricity. If you look back to those pie charts that I said before, it's not just electricity. Transport is a very important part of this story. And indeed, Vivid Economics and the International Energy Agency have calculated that passenger transport will be a much bigger investment market than uh, low carbon uh, than um, low carbon uh, power in these next uh, in these next few decades i could go on through the sectors but i wanted to give you a feel for just how dynamic this story and just how much uh, industry is changing now some people will tell you that if you have responsible prices uh, for carbon if you have responsible policies towards the environment, that everybody will migrate uh, their economic activities to places which don't have such policies and are dirty. Uh, in the Stern Review, we look carefully at the evidence on this, and it really is not strong. Mostly, this is just a slogan without numbers. Uh, the, the movement of uh, firms in relation to environment reg environmental regulation seems to be very small. There's so many other factors at work. The availability of skilled labor, transport costs, the reliability of infrastructure, the, the quality of the investment climate in terms of potential for government interference and so on. These things generally overweigh environmental regulation. There's not much evidence for footloose uh, in, or footlooseness in response to environmental policy, even though you hear a great deal about it. We did, we looked at the evidence in the Stern Review. Aldi and Pizer have recently looked at that evidence again. It really doesn't uh, stack up. So it's important, and you hear it, and you do hear it often, to challenge it. And remember that uh, many countries around the world, and that's something I'm about to turn to for the last few minutes of what I have to say, uh, many countries around the world are moving quite strongly in responsible environmental directions. If you pick up and move, which is very costly, on the assumption that you're going to move to an area that's going to stay dirty, then it's quite likely that you'd prove to be wrong. So this story of footlooseness, I think, is badly overdone, even though you hear it 
being uh, advanced uh, quite often. We'll start to bring their prices, start to bring their practices into responsibility uh, together in those particular industries. But you certainly don't want to let that small, do small tail wag the whole dog of economic policy. There's lots of creativity in agriculture. I haven't got the time to uh, go into that in any detail, but I did talk about low-till agriculture and the management of water. Forests, too, we start to see strong progress in ways of managing and reducing forests. Indonesia, for example, has great potential in using degraded land for palm oil. If you use degraded land for palm oil, then you're actually growing trees and you're capturing carbon. If you cut down uh, pristine uh, rainforest, then you're doing enormous damage and releasing huge amounts of carbon. If you're growing palm oil or soya in Brazil in that way, then you're doing a great deal of damage. If you use degraded land, then you may well be uh, doing some good. There are all kinds of margins. There's the intensity of cultivation. Roughly speaking, in Brazil, you've got one head of cattle per hectare. That means a cat, one, cat, one animal has to look for about 100 meters before seeing a friend. Now, none of us are in favor of battery farming, but you must be um, able to cultivate land more intensively than uh, one head of cattle per hectare. There are all kinds of margins that you can operate on, and that kind of creativity is really starting to come forward. Now, I'm going to be very quick on just remarking about where different countries are going. China's 12th five-year plan, published in uh, about 10 months ago, is a great step forward in looking at uh, moving to a much cleaner economy. At the moment, that's offset by China's very rapid growth rate and China's emissions are moving up strongly. But nevertheless, that shift in focus is of great importance. Korea and China, in the recovery plans in the recession that started to hit, hit them in 2009, focused very strongly on uh, green technologies. Ethiopia and Rwanda are making their plans now very much on the basis of controlling and reducing carbon emissions as they increase uh, their uh, income per head uh, very rapidly. Wherever you look in different parts of the world, you're starting to see that kind of uh, change take place. So there's lots of encouraging signs, lots of experimentation and in technology and in policy and so on. It really is moving very quickly. I'm not going to go them, to them in any detail. As I mentioned, the slides are already up on uh, the CEP website. You can go home tonight and download them, amuse yourself and check the references and go into the countries in uh, a bit more detail. But the examples I give of China, Korea, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and the uh, United States. Often we think of United States as being in uh, a fit of denial, but there are all kinds of things going on in the US. Now, I know the Republican Party has declared um, war on the laws of physics, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that that doesn't mean that nothing is happening. I've already given the example of the uh, US Navy quietly getting on with it and aiming for 50% of non-hydrocarbon fuels um, by 2020. The military takes science and technology seriously and they really understand risk, at least some of them do. And uh, not surprisingly, and they take quite a long-term view. Um, if you look at uh, New York, it's got quite strong. New York City and Mayor Bloomberg has got quite strong plans for reducing emissions. The California Cap and Trade Scheme began at the uh, beginning of January. Uh, Texas has got a very large wind capacity and it's increasing strongly. And who'd have thought when the Stern Review was published five and a half years ago that General Motors will be making an electric car? I mean, you really have seen quite extraordinary change, even in places which often look quite depressing, like the United States. The United States is an extraordinarily varied country, as we know very well, and all kinds of things are going on inside, at the state level, at the city level, at the company level, and in the US uh, Navy. And even the, the um, mercury and air toxic standards that are coming in from the EPA, they could have a radical effect on the viability of coal-fired uh, coal power stations. Nobody in the United States is building a new coal-fired power station, but these EPA standards may actually force them to close quite a lot of them. So don't despair. Now next time, I'm just, this is just a marker for tomorrow, I'm going to talk about, when I talk about international agreement, about strategies for recovery and strategies 
for growth. So I've tried to tell a story of how we foster this change through economic policy and what kind of change is embodied. And there are very optimistic lines in this story. We can see how much we have to do, we can see the technologies that will deliver it, we can see the economic policies that can foster that change, and we can see some movement. But it's nowhere near fast enough, and that's in large measure because the political will is not yet strong enough to make that happen. So next time I want to talk a bit more about how to create that will, how to create that willingness for action both at the national and at the international level. That's the subject of tomorrow. Thank you. Well, Nick, what a, what a fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you so much and certainly encouraging in, in, in some respects. I wanted to ask you, uh, I mean, you, you started off your list of externalities with public goods um, of knowledge um, and said, well, we, we, we all know about that too, we moved on to other things. But, I mean, if we take basic science research, it's probably necessary to get really effective uh, undercutting of carbon uh, in terms of low-cost, non-carbon energy. I mean, is the world doing anything like as much basic science on uh, research on energy production as it should do? I think, I forget what it is in Britain, of, of our research budget, is it five or less than 10% of all our science research budget, I think, is on, on energy research, which seems extraordinary if you think this is the biggest problem facing the world. And, and it's usually, the energy research is usually greatly influenced by nuclear, which is a very expensive mm. form of research, but not necessarily wrong to pursue it, of course. But often those energy numbers are greatly influenced by nuclear. I do think that uh, um, a great, in, a big investment in our scientific and technology universities does matter. When we were writing the Stern Review, we went to see uh, Toyota in, in Japan. And uh, that was obviously close to my heart since I used to be chairman of the Centauri Toyota International Center <laughs> for Economics and Related Disciplines at the LSE. And uh, actually, Yoko Morishima is with us this evening, and Michio Morishima was the founder of that center. And we went to, it wasn't because of that history, but that history made it sort of friendlier. Uh, we went to see Toyota and asked them about moving towards electric cars and hybrids. And of course, they already had the Prius at that time. And he insisted that whilst they were putting enormous amounts of sums into the research, the challenges with batteries were more fundamental than the engineering in technology at Toyota, which is pretty good, mm. would allow. Yeah. So they were looking to universities <coughs> to help give them a lead. And you are seeing in MIT and in Cambridge, England, quite strong emphasis, for example, on nanobatteries. But that could well be the kind of breakthrough in storage that we're going to uh, need to liberate a lot of the um, potential of uh, renewables. You can liberate them through better grids, liberate them through more sensible uh, pricing systems, but also I think there's probably some fundamental research necessary in storage. Now, I'm not an engineer, but that's an example where it does seem to me that fundamental research will be very important. Algae, I think, is an, also an area uh, where fundamental research will be important. Uh, it may have an enormous potential in biofuels, which is not diverting um, resources from food production in the kind of way which allocating land to biofuels would do. But that probably needs a lot of uh, detailed and fairly basic biotech research. So nanobatteries, biotech, nuclear, um, they all seem to me to be areas where fundamental research in our technological universities are important. We do, of course, have the European Institute of Technology, which may well get, uh, get us somewhere. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, Christoph Dock, a master management student here at LSE.
Um, Professor Stern, you were talking about the, um, the role of the private sector and also the deficiencies of risk management. So I've done a little bit of research on um, the topic on like the climate risk, uh, climate change risk management in and investment decision making. And I found that like for many companies in different sectors and industries, it seems that the data collection process and then like the actual usefulness of the data um, that is available is not yet so useful to really uh, take it into account into their like investment decision making. And I want to ask you, could you give me some insights on what you think about the actual information that is needed for private sector companies or characteristics of information uh, on climate change risk that could make it more useful? Uh, should we collect? Okay, okay. Here, here's one. Thank you. Uh, Chris Brown from Igloo. You talked a bit, you mentioned uh, dirty products, and I wondered if you thought there was any role for trade barriers uh, in the policy response. Hello, Niels Handler, student here at the LSE. I was just wondering, can you say something about air travel, which is maybe not as good as an uh, example where like a great leap forward in terms of technology is not really in sight and competition and foot looseness is much more of a problem? I wonder if we should just get a lot more and then you just make like a general point. Yeah. Mm. Hi, uh, Jonathan Coleman from the Grantham Institute in Stickard. Um, I'm a PhD student here. Uh, my, my question is on a slightly different tangent. Um, from an academic perspective, if you were doing your PhD now, <laughs> what, do we, what do you think your, your research would be, uh, well, would, would, would be heading? <laughs> slightly slightly self-interested, of course. <laughs> Good question. Um, that's a, yeah. Given the importance of reducing the share of coal and hydrocarbon electricity generation, is it the time to reevaluate the role of nuclear energy? Maybe that's can enough. I, can I have a go? Yes. Um, I, I take it when you're talking about climate risk, you're talking about uh, current climate risk and uh, adaptation. Is that is that correct? Yeah, but well, sorry, I'm taking that as a question about adaptation. Um, adaptation does require strong local information in a way that the story about mitigation I was talking about is uh, very different. That you can conduct at the global level and ask, because it's a global phenomenon, and ask how much you need to bring down global emissions. If your climate is changing around you, if the rainfall patterns are doing, if you're more prone to drought and subsidence, you're uh, more prone to floods. I mean, we live here in London on a flood plain and the risk of floods has gone up enormously. Um, you're going to need, in order to adapt to that, much more precise and local information. And that's a real challenge. And I think that is uh, a, vital, a vitally important public good which local weather and climate um, uh, organisations ought to be providing. And to be fair, the Hadley Centre in the UK does try to provide that. But it's a much more difficult task to give that local uh, information about the risks. But it is a task that uh, involves a great deal of investment. And when I was in the Treasury, I tried to do my best to get them as a big a computer as possible, because that is a big part of the story, because of the precision you need and the local definition. Dirty products, well, the short answer to that is yes. There's a good, uh, I, I've been working against trade barriers as somebody deeply committed to development all my life. Most arguments in favour of trade barriers are disreputable. This one is not. This is one that says uh, if a country itself or a locality itself is not correctly pricing for the damage that this production is generating, then uh, consumers uh, should be faced with the full cost of production of the product. If they're not doing it there, then you can do it at the border. So it's actually, I think, a correction of a market failure and the inability to act or the unwillingness 
to act uh, somewhere else. I would prefer to do it later rather than sooner because it does produce um, uh, quarrelsomeness and difficulty and arm wrestling and fist fighting and so on. The more we can get people to act together on this one, the better it would be. So I would keep it uh, up the sleeve for 10 years from now and say, well, those countries that are making a big effort to, grow, to go uh, clean uh, are going to let you know that uh, 10 years from now, if you don't get your act together, you're going to face these kind of um, barriers. Air travel, it is a small part of the problem at the moment. It might be about 3% of emissions, but of course it's growing. I think at some point we're going to have to find ways of powering uh, jet engines with something other than hydrocarbons. You can already do that in biofuels. These engines will burn pretty well whatever you put in them, but it would be a bit unfortunate if it froze at high altitude and so on. So the characteristics of these fuels do matter. But it does seem to me that uh, people are going to continue to fly. You're not going to be able to stop that. Um, and it would be, uh, well, you'd be politically untenable to do that, and it would be a restriction on people's freedom. So the answer is to find a way of fueling the aeroplane in uh, a way that's much less damaging. So I think this whole story of algae and biofuels, for example, could well be the story of the future. But I don't want to say that it is or it isn't. That's the kind of thing that we're going to have to investigate. But you're going to have to have a fuel that's light enough to produce the power that you need to keep an aeroplane in the air. In many places, of course, there are alternatives like uh, high-speed uh, trains. You can make aeroplanes much more efficient through the airframes and through the engines. You can stop stacking them up over Heathrow for a half an hour at a time by simply uh, taxing the slots at uh, Heathrow uh, fairly heavily. There are lots of things that you can do, but ultimately it seems to me that you're going to have to find a way of, uh, or find fuels that have got a good enough power to weight ratio to keep aeroplanes in the air. And uh, that, I think, is most likely to be a biofuel of some shape or form. And we'll find out what shape or form. What would my PhD be? Um, well, I'm a policy wonk, I suppose. Uh, I love the details of policy. And I would focus on dynamic public economics. Uh, I edited the Journal of Public Economics with Tony Atkinson here at the LSE. Uh, from Stickerd for nearly 20 years. I think it's fair to say it was mostly a fairly static story. It was not so much about public economics and public policy for fostering change. Public policy where time matters, it really is important to do this uh, rapidly. That seems to me to be an absolutely fascinating uh, intellectual, intellectual challenge. And of course all the political economy that uh, comes with it. So I think that's where my uh, PhD would be. Mine was an optimum growth when I was a young lad. And uh, that's sort of dynamic, but it's a sort of a fully planned story. It's not really a decentralization story where you have to think about the kind of incentives that you're going to put in place. The share of coal and nuclear, I think that uh, nuclear is likely to have a big role. Um, China, as we both know, um, by the way, Atta Hussein is one of the world's experts on China and many other things here at the LSE. China will uh, produce in the next, or will create in the next 20 years, something like 200 nuclear power stations at about a, gig, about a gigawatt ago. Uh, and that it will be the first time, I think, in history will have seen the production of nuclear power stations on, if you like, an industrial and mass scale. We saw it a bit in France when they went very quickly uh, to nuclear, but nothing like what's going to happen now. We'll find out whether you can really bring the cost of production for nuclear down in the same way that other costs of production have come down through the process of experience. In the past, cost of production for nuclear have been fairly flat. Um, so I do think that you're going to see a great expansion in nuclear. But even when China builds 200 nuclear power stations at average size, one gigawatt, 
over these next 20 years. In 2030, that's likely to be about 15% of China's capacity. So we're going to have to get much better at energy efficiency, much better at uh, renewables, and probably much better at carbon capture and storage. So I think a straight substitution of nuclear for coal just couldn't deliver on the scale of which we have to act. But it'll probably be, whether we like it or not, a part of the story, perhaps 15%, 20% of the story, depending which country you look at, except for France, where it's you know, obviously much more, much more than that. Yeah, the, the Lord says we should stop. <laughs> um, I, I know there are lots more questions, but there'll be another time uh, tomorrow, uh, same time, same place, uh, where you'll get the final episode of the story and we'll get our marching orders. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so yes. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.